Good evening, y'all, and thanks for being with us here today. Uh, my name is Mara Shalif. I am ProPublica's editor in the South. Uh, we're so glad you're here. We're going to give this just a few minutes uh, so a few more people can join us, then we'll get started. Uh, a quick note, this event is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed to everyone who registered. Um, I should also let you know that there's closed caption, there's a closed caption option um, that is available by clicking, uh, by enabling uh, the closed caption button that's uh, on the bar toward the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question during the session, and you can do so at any time, and we love questions, uh, click the Q&A icon that's at the bottom of your screen, and uh, that'll submit the question to us. We'll be answering questions toward the end of the event. Um, so it looks like we have enough people to get started. Uh, thank you again for joining us for today's conversation about the legacy of segregation academies. Uh, I'd like to invite reporter um, Jennifer Barry Hawes to join us on screen uh, and start to walk us through a recap of her investigation. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Mara. It's nice to see you. Um, so uh, this really began a number of years ago, really when I was working at the newspaper in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, we were working on a project looking at the state of public education in South Carolina. And one of the pieces of that that I handled was looking at how the history of the state played forward into uh, some very stark school um, disparities. And so I went to a place called Somerton, South Carolina, which is the birthplace of a court case called Briggs versus Elliott, which is one of the cases that later was grouped together uh, into uh, a group of cases that we now know as Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, and in Somerton, I found um, uh, a very interesting situation, which is that most of the Black students in the community went to the public schools, and almost all of the white students in the community went to private schools, including one called Clarendon Hall, which I later learned is what researchers call a segregation academy. Uh, and so later, uh, jump forward a few years. Let me ask you a quick question. I'm going to jump in. Okay. Sorry. Can you just very simply, if it can be simple, define like what is a segregation academy? What does that mean? So a segregation academy is a private school that's generally defined as um, one that opened between 1954 when the Brown decision came down and around 1976, which is um, basically after the last of a series of federal court cases dealing with desegregation was resolved. Um, these are private schools that open across the South um, with uh, all white or vastly white student bodies. And, and basically, you know, it's hard to prove intent, but the idea is that they opened uh, to allow for white flight from public schools that were uh, being forced to admit black students. Who originated the term or who uses it? I'm curious. You know, it's a term that's mostly used by researchers, uh, people who study school segregation. Um, but I'm actually kind of surprised as I've gone around the South, how many uh, people know it uh, and understand the term in a more, um, you know, sort of common usage. And how many still exist and how many were there to begin with, I suppose, would be worth asking. Yeah, it's not, it's not clear how many there were to begin with because they're, the record keeping varies quite a bit um, by state. I've seen estimates from the hundreds into the thousands. Um, but with my colleagues here, um, or our colleagues, uh, Molly Simon and Sergio Hernandez, we were able to find about 300 of them that still operate today. And so talk to us a little bit about how your work for ProPublica on this topic began and where it took you. So as I mentioned, I had looked at, at this in one state um, several years ago and, and, and with our team covering the South, wanted to see uh, how much these schools were still impacting the region, particularly because this is the 70th anniversary of the Brown decision. Uh, and what we found is that where these schools operate, they do very often still perpetuate segregated schools. And so I wanted to find a community where we could really dig into the implications of this uh, and along the way, I ran into a master's thesis by one of our panelists today. We'll hear more from Amberly Sheffield. But she wrote a, a really interesting thesis about a place called Wilcox County in the Black Belt of Alabama, 
Uh, and I had been looking at the Black Belt as a place to go. Uh, and so I wound up in the uh, county seat of Camden, where I found that the schools were uh, and are starkly segregated between the public schools and a segregation academy called Wilcox Academy. Uh, and so the situation looks very much like it did before Brown. And so we we really wanted to, as I said, dig into the implications of that. Um, and what did, did tell me tell us a little bit about Wilcox and Camden and also tell us what it might have surprised you or just a sort of headline of what you learned there. We'll hear a lot from the people uh, who know Camden well, um, some of them on this call, but curious, you know, how you found the town to be. So Wilcox County is a rural county, as I said, in the Black Belt of Alabama. Um, it's very, um, it's very pretty, you know, it has rolling hills, the Alabama River runs through it. Uh, Camden is a small town of a few thousand people, the county seat. Um, but it's a it, it's an area like a lot of the Black Belt. Um, I'm in South Carolina, and it's the same here, where you have counties that are losing population and that do not have a whole lot of resources to begin with. And what I found in Camden was that um, there is a division of those resources. Of course, you have people who the whole community is paying into public schools, but then white families who tend to be the, the people who have the most resources are taking their resources with them to the private school, funding and tuition, you know, fundraisers and all those kinds of things. Um, but it also created a real divide in the community between people, between black and white residents who in a small community might otherwise know each other pretty well, often really did not. Um, so you had the division of resources and then you had um, a separation of people uh, that had existed you know, for, for generations now. Um, but one of the things that was really interesting when I got there was how many people, black and white, I spoke to who were very heartfelt about expressing that they really wanted to come together more and they wanted their children to come together more. But after so long apart, they really weren't sure how. And so there, there had come to be, uh, you know, that sense of sort of that's just how things are. Um, small towns, you know, are slow to change and that kind of thing. Um, but I said- I can also say big cities are small to change too. True, true, yes. Or slow to change, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but there was um, but many people expressed, um, as I said, a real um, just a real earnest desire, I think, to to know each other better. And is there anything else about your reporting you think is important to know before we bring in the people who have these deep connections to Wilcox County? What else um, strikes you as a surprising finding or uh, something you think? I mean, I, I look at Wilcox as a unique place, but it's also a microcosm and, and of other places, right? And so, um, absolutely. And I, I think that the the main takeaway for me was that if the community was able to come together, especially a shrinking community, and as you mentioned, there are many that Wilcox is is one of many. Uh, if people could come together more in the schools, the schools themselves would be able to offer more. You know, they'd be able to offer more programs. They'd be able to recruit more and better teachers they would be able to field more competitive sports teams you know all of the things that a, a school with some additional students can can offer um so that so the fact that that wasn't happening was um um uh, one of my big takeaways and you've been inside the one of the public schools in wilcox could you just talk a little bit about that i look forward to hearing more about that in the call but um you had a really interesting uh, and sort of useful experience being in there. So the the I was in the public high school, Wilcox Central High School, um, and it's in a, a building that's much larger than the student body that's uh, that it's serving at the time. Um, you know, it has a competitive competition sized swimming pool. It has uh, a medical lab with uh, various mannequins that do all kinds of functions that students can uh, train on. Uh, it, it really offered quite a number of a large number of certifications. It has a welding lab and all of those kinds of things. Um, but the building is much smaller than the the community of students who who attended. Uh, to me, again, it was kind of a testament to the fact that 
if all the students there or more of them certainly went to school together, um, um, that school may be able to offer even more. Well, I want to say that I'm very grateful to the people um, with deep connections to Wilcox schools who've helped expand our understanding of the legacy of segregation. And I'm very excited uh, to hear directly from them. So let's bring them on. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes, and thank you, Mara, for helping us uh, get this started. I'd like to invite the panelists now to join us on screen. And I'm gonna offer some brief introductions real quickly. Um, we have with us Cheryl Threadgill Matthews, who is a native of Camden, uh, the county seat of Wilcox County. Um, and Cheryl in 1966 was one of nine black students who first desegregated the all white public schools in the county. Um, after graduating from college, uh, she returned to Camden, uh, was employed by the Wilcox County Department of Human Resources for 29 years as a social worker, quality assurance coordinator, resource developer. Um, Cheryl is very deeply involved in many groups in Camden. I can't even begin to list them here. Um, but she often says that her greatest accomplishment was uh, the 1993 co-founding of Bama Kids, which is a local nonprofit youth development organization, which she still operates for children in Camden and is, as I learned, where you will usually find her if you are looking for her. Um, we also have with us Amberly Sheffield. Um, she grew up in rural Alabama where she attended public schools before earning her bachelor's and master's degrees in history from Auburn University. She also taught at a segregation academy and wrote her master's thesis uh, entitled Segregation Academies in Rural Alabama, White Resisters' Final Stand Against School Integration in Wilcox County, which is the thesis that I mentioned earlier. Uh, she is currently a PhD student at the University of Mississippi, where she studies the establishment of segregation academies in rural Alabama. And last and certainly not least, we have Dr. Andre Salisbury, who is the superintendent of public schools in Wilcox County uh, and is a graduate of the schools that he now leads. After high school, he graduated magna cum laude from Langston University, then earned his doctorate at the University of Alabama. He went on to teach English, serve as a principal and assistant superintendent, among many other roles before being named superintendent. Um, he doesn't know this, but his former French teacher told me that he was also one of the top students that she ever had. Uh, so welcome panel. Uh, I really, really appreciate you joining us for today's conversation. And I'd like to start with a question to each of you that will help uh, our listeners just uh, know a little bit more about you and your experiences and interactions with Alabama's segregated schools. Uh, so let's start with Cheryl. Um, Cheryl, your father was a minister and a prominent leader in Wilcox County's civil rights movement. Um, and his work led you to become one of the first black students to desegregate the white public high school when you were a freshman. Um, as we discussed, um, it proved to be a very difficult um, and even traumatic school year for you. And so I wonder if you would tell us a little bit uh, first off about that experience. Yes, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, yeah, my family was involved in both the voting rights movement in the 60s and then uh, the desegregation movement. And we, um, Wilcox County Schools, like many school systems in the state, had defied the court order to integrate until September 1966, when the order came that first, second, third grades, seventh, eighth, and ninth grades would have the freedom of choice. I was in the ninth grade and my brother Larry was in the seventh grade. And my parents decided that of the two of us, I would be the one to enroll in Wilcox County High School. Uh, we thought there would be more, because this was something we had been fighting for for years. However, we found that because of fear of reprisal and some other issues that there were nine of us to enroll. I remember gathering at the Antioch Baptist Church to travel to Wilcox County High School with our parents. I was somewhat apprehensive but excited 
because after all, this is something we have been fighting for. My father took me into the auditorium at the school and registered me and paid my 25 cents for lunch. And as I said, I was excited about a new experience and meeting new friends from another culture, another race. And I quickly learned that it was going to be a lot of adversity, especially when we got ready for lunch. I met um, Erskine Scott, who was in the eighth grade, and he had such a look of fear on his face. I could still see it today. And he was covered with food and chocolate milk. And when I asked him what happened, he said that some of the boys in the cafeteria had taken his lunch and thrown it on him. And I decided that day it probably would not be safe for me to go into the cafeteria to eat lunch, so I just skipped lunch. And every day after then, as the physical assaults continued, which were frequent, there were daily assaults physically, students rammed chairs into Mac constantly while I was trying to study and listen to what was being taught. I had long hair down to my shoulders and every day it was plastered with chalk dust. And um, the thing, the one of the most disturbing things were that most of the teachers would either leave the room or turn their backs so that this assault could take place. Um, I had one teacher, English teacher, uh, Miss Bonnie Mitchell, who stated that she was not going to tolerate that type of treatment in her class. That was the only class where I felt like I could matriculate in a normal manner. So, um, you know, like I said, every day it was physical abuse. I wasn't, I was a good student. I had left Cannon Academy where I was, had nurturing teachers, good friends, a great academic environment to go to Wilcox County High School where I was assaulted every day and was not allowed to uh, process my, my education as I normally would. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Cheryl. Um, Dr. Salisbury, let me let me switch to you. Um, you grew up in Wilcox County and attended the public schools. Um, tell us about your experience there, um, what it was like and what role you've seen school segregation play in keeping the black and white communities of Wilcox County apart. Okay. Well, first I'd like to say thank you, Jennifer, for including me in this. And uh, to Ms. Thread Gill, uh, you kind of educated me on some things that I didn't quite know even being here this long. Uh, now, back to the, the earlier question. Uh, yes, I grew up in, in, in Wilcox County. Uh, I went to school here. And uh, that question again, Jennifer, specifically was? Sure. Tell me about that experience. What were the public schools like for you? And what was it like to have the black and white communities uh, separated Okay. Well, uh, well, growing up in Wilcox County, I, I would say I had a, a few uh, white friends that lived in the community. It was less than 10, probably around five or six or seven. Uh, a few rode the bus, less than five. Uh, however, uh, going to, I look forward to going to school. Uh, it was like, it was not a big issue because we had such awesome teachers who embraced and engaged us in school until, you know, that did not seem to be an issue for a person in elementary school or even up into middle school. Uh, we had African-American, we had Black teachers as well as white teachers. I remember one person specifically, uh, Barbara, Barbara Cresswell, who was an elementary teacher, who took a group of us in two vehicles and she toured us all around the county and outside of the county singing Christmas carols and presenting them at different areas. So, at that time, culturally, I really did not know what I might have been missing because the teachers, the educators were so awesome and so well respected at that time. Great, thank you. Um, and Amberly, uh, let's talk about, you grew up all in rural, a rural Alabama county nearby uh, that had segregation academies, although you went to a public school. Uh, after earning your bachelor's degree, you taught at Wilcox Academy. Uh, which is a segregation academy in Camden. 
And I'm curious what you learned during that experience and how that um, fed into your interest uh, to go on to study segregation academies uh, professionally. Yeah, so um, growing up, I went to a public school and I always kind of wondered why parents would pay to send their kids to a private school. Um, that was always a question in the back of my mind, knowing that two of these schools existed in my county. Um, but I never had heard the term segregation academy. Um, and so when I graduated with my BA in history, for those of you who have a BA in history, there's not very much you can do with it. And so I was kind of like, I want to say in my field, teaching sounds like a really, you know, fun way to start off my life. And so I applied to a couple of these private schools because I didn't have a teaching certificate. I couldn't teach at a public school. Um, and so I got a job at Wilcox Academy. And um, so I, I knew of the Brown decision, you know, Brown takes place in 1954, it rules that schools must integrate, but I didn't know much about what happens after. So in undergrad, you're kind of taught that like Brown happens and it kind of fixes everything. And so when I arrived at the school, I kind of just wondered if Brown fixed everything, then why do these schools exist? And so I started just looking into like demographics of the county, um, and then just like the public school demographics. And I realized that the county is very segregated today, especially in education. Um, and so when I went to get my master's, I knew I wanted to study segregation academies. I originally wanted to look at the impact of segregation academies on the public schools. But then I started to realize as I talked to more professors that there's actually not a lot written about segregation academies in Alabama. Um, there's some work done on Mississippi, but it's kind of it's not dedicated to segregation academies. It's kind of like a local study and then they'll have a chapter about segregation academies. And so I felt like this was just research that really needed to be done just to understand like how and why they were established. So that's how I came across my research. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, that that kind of then begs the question, Cheryl, I'm going to put this to you and several of our readers uh, sent in variations of the same question. And it basically is, you know, why does segregation matter? Um, or maybe another way to think about it in my mind is um, if when black and white children in Camden don't go to the same schools, you know, what are the implications of that? Um, you went to a quality private uh, Presbyterian school for black children, uh, and now you're experiencing public schools that are are um, segregated. So why does it matter? Why does it matter if black and white children go to school together or not? Uh, Jennifer, it matters because segregation hampers the overall development of the entire community. In a community like Wilcox County, where there aren't a lot, a lot of resources, a lot of, a lot of institutions, I was at the center of life, any of us. We uh, celebrate the accomplishments of our students. We look forward to the sport, sporting events and we support our schools and our students. And when, when we separate like that, it's really a disservice to the students because they don't get a chance to experience the culture of other races. I interacted with several white students and especially our chain ambassador, and we have found that, especially it seems that the white students don't appreciate being being separated. I spoke to them about coming back to Wilcox, taking some leadership positions, and most of them said, no, I don't want to come back to Wilcox County because I just don't want to continue to live like this. And I've heard from at least one parent after some of the students went away saying, when we were in Wilcox, we were living in a bubble. When they leave here and experience other cultures and, and experience the real world, because Cox County and these uh, in our separate school systems are not indicative of the world, even counties adjacent to ours, like Clark County, and they leave even they experience other cultures and have rich varied experiences, they don't want to come back. That drains our works. And it happens the overall development of our community. And as you said earlier, it's the support to our to both school systems. Yeah. 
Thank you, Cheryl. Um, Dr. Salisbury, let me follow up um, with you on that. I'd like to hear from you a little more specifically on the resource question. So when, when students are divided into separate school systems, essentially, especially in a community that's losing population and struggling with resources to begin with, um, what's lost? How does that affect the schools? What is, what is lost for students? And um, uh, if you could address that in terms of resources in particular. Okay. Well, in terms in terms of resources, I think that uh, students could be exposed to so much more, so many different programs. Uh, as we have at Wilcox Central High School, you have your CNA certified nurse assistant, your welders coming out making seventy thousand plus. Uh, you have so many programs that they just don't offer a high school diploma alone. You come out with so many certifications, so that's one thing. But when it talks about the community in general, I think it's stifles uh, growth so much because, because they are not together, they don't have a clear understanding. So you have the whites maybe voting for things that they feel uh, support the white community. Then you have blacks maybe voting for things they feel support the black community instead of just supporting things wholeheartedly, like maybe parks and other recreational activities, uh, bringing different performances off Broadway here and other things like that. That would be uh, that would be viewed as the funding coming from both communities to make it happen. So in some cases. It, it, it's it's stipends, stifles uh, things there uh, when you when you have them separated because I think in some cases because of misunderstanding you don't know each other and because you don't know each other understand each other and understand that you have so many more similarities than you do differences and that you could have so many just great things in this beautiful scenic Wilcox County. Instead of voting alone, not just party lines, but voting alone, what I call black white lines. Thank you, thank you, um, Amberly. Let me let me follow up with that to to give people an idea of why segregation academies opened. Um, it's interesting if you go back, they didn't often, you know, put an advertisement in the newspaper that said we're, we're opening only for white students. But it's pretty clear, isn't it, that the reason that they opened at these times uh, was to avoid the arrival of black students in the public schools. Could you talk a little bit about the um, sort of the origin story of these schools? Yeah, um, so Brown v. Board happens in 1954, and there's a famous quote in that decision that says with all deliberate speed which basically says there's no timeline there's no requirements for like when these schools have to be desegregated um and so for about 10 years nothing really happens the federal government finally starts to enforce brown around 1964 and they have to local boards have to start implementing plans which is when the Freedom of Choice Plan gets implemented in Wilcox County, along with many other counties throughout the South. And that's how Mrs. Sherrill ends up with the Freedom of Choice Plan in 1966. Um, but for a long time, the local school board was able to like keep tokenism within their schools. So they were able to only allow a small number of African-American students within the white schools. And so finally, in 1969, there is a new Supreme Court ruling called Alexander v. Holmes, where they say that all deliberate speed ruling in Brown is irrelevant, it's not working, and so now we have to desegregate with, with actual deliberate speed, like you need to do it now. And so um, basically, this is a trigger warning to say, hey, white families, you need to get your kids out of those schools. And so you see a very large number of segregation academies open in 1970. Wilcox Academy is one of these. Um, and basically, like you said, they don't use racial language within their like openings, but they do have a lot of fundraisers that I found in the historical evidence um, where they're raising money for the school 
And one of their most successful fundraisers is something called the Spring Festival. And in the advertisement, they talk about you can go on a tour of the antebellum homes that are in pristine condition. You can go through the Confederate graveyard. You can buy guns at the gun booth um, during the Spring Festival. And so if you know anything about the racial climate of Wilcox County during 1970, you know that a black man is not going to be able to go up to a booth and buy a gun from a white man. It's just not something that they're going to be able to do without receiving a lot of backlash and potentially a lot of violence towards them, right? And so also just the environment of like the Confederacy and the antebellum Old South and things like that aren't going to be very welcoming to the African American community. And so even though they're not using um, white language, they're not saying like these are only for white students. It's very well understood during the time period that these schools are for white students. And in fact, as I understand it, some of them have have chosen mascots like the rebels and the Confederates and have names, uh, you know, of, of Confederate figures. Uh, could you also, just as a quick follow up, uh, several readers wrote in questions that had to do with basically this question. Um, how is it that you still have school segregation given the Brown decision? I know you're not a lawyer, you're a historian, but the but nonetheless, why why how does this continue when you have um, you know, a court case that uh, was designed to avoid it? Yeah, so basically um, these schools allow for segregation that bypasses federal regulation. They aren't regulated by the federal government. They, when they open, they're not receiving federal money from the government. Um, and so they basically can do whatever they want. They're not accredited by the government. They're accredited by an institution called the Alabama Independent School Association. Um, and there's a few different accreditation organizations throughout Alabama and I'm sure elsewhere. Um, but yeah, so basically they don't really have to answer to that federal decision, the Supreme Court decision to segregate because they're not taking any federal money. So they're all private. They're privatized. You can do what you want in your private setting, you know? So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and it, Cheryl, I want to go back to you. One of the things that you and I talked about that really, um, really stuck with me uh, after I left Camden was when, when you talked about what it's like, you were taking your um, great nephew to school and you were talking about what it's like now to see the schools uh, still look as separate as they did back in the days when you desegregated Wilcox County High School. So talk, talk to me a little bit, if you would, about how it feels to you, uh, given there were so many children across the South who went through experiences like you did, and to now be in, in communities that remain largely segregated in the schools. Uh, what is that like, um, uh, seeing that continue in Camden? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's really sad, Jennifer, and as I mentioned earlier, it's a disservice to our students. We um, do get a chance to interact some in the community around arts and some maybe little league sports, but it, it's really isolated. And when we see um, children playing together from different school systems in these isolated incidences and isolated circumstances, it, you know, it makes you wonder what would it be like if students got a chance to really to know each other on a personal level. Dr. Salisbury mentioned it as well. It, it's, it's really, it's, it's a disservice. It's a disservice to our students and a disservice to our community. And I think if overall, if, if both communities realized what service it was, we would do more to try to bring our students together. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Salisbury, I'm curious, um, how does school segregation affect perceptions in the community of the public schools, particularly among white and, um, and particularly among white people? Do you find that the white community has certain perceptions about your schools um, that you find to be unfair or unwarranted? Well, you know, I'm not quite sure what 
the white community perceptions may be. However, I can honestly say that when we look at the offerings in the public schools, not just coming out with a high school diploma, but as I said earlier, uh, with all the certified nurse assistants, the certified welders, the skid steel operators, the serve safe managers, the Microsoft IT specialists, uh, when you see all of those uh, credentials being earned, I believe that we are providing a quality, a top quality program for this uh, region of the Black Belt. That oftentimes will take students out of the Black Belt, unfortunately, to other cases, to other uh, areas for employment. So uh, my concentration has just been simply not so much on their perception, but on building a strong program for our students. However, if we understood the value of what both school programs could bring if they came together, there may be so many more opportunities for us to attract industries and so many other things where some of these great students would not have to leave here and go other places with their CNAs and their welding certifications and things like that. So I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure to be fair. I'm not quite sure. I think it's about their perception of whether it's, it's superior or inferior. Uh, I would say that I believe that a lot of it is just based solely on Southern tradition more that they are maintained. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Um, and, and really, let me let me switch to you um, real quickly before we open it up to other questions. Uh, I'd like to talk briefly at least about the school voucher movement because this obviously is something that um, has taken off across the country. Uh, and I'm curious how, how you see the current voucher movement in terms of what happened after the Brown decision. Do you see many parallels between uh, what is being enacted in states, including Alabama, and what was occurring? Uh, up, the Alabama legislature obviously allocated money um, the, in the late 60s to help white students flee public schools. Could you help us connect the dots between um, between then and now? Yeah, I think a lot of it in current politics is going to depend on like the region and the type of schools. So I actually learned this from you, Jennifer, that a lot of these schools don't participate in like sending their statistics in. And so they can't, they don't qualify for the voucher program. Um, and so I think a lot of these schools are not going to benefit from the voucher program, but I think a lot of the larger schools, probably one that comes to mind is like Montgomery Academy, which is already full of resources from like very wealthy white families. Um, I think they're probably going to benefit a lot from just, you know, more white Montgomery Montgomeryans. Is that the right way to say that? Um, fleeing to those schools as well and using state resources. Um, but I definitely... Sorry, I got distracted by the thing. Um, but I definitely think from a historical standpoint, you see a lot of federal money being put into these schools, particularly a little bit later. So in the Reagan era, he kind of signed into laws that allow, if, if people of color come to these schools, they allow them to get federal funding. So the segregation academy in my Hometown actually changed its mascot from the Rebels to the Gators in the hopes that they would have more students of color enroll in the school so that they could get federal funding. Um, so I hope that helps. It does, it does, thank you. And I, I would just add the explanation that the, the schools that Amberly's talking about, uh, we found that a number of the, the segregation academies are not participating in the current um, sort of voucher-like program in Alabama, and that may be partly because there's a requirement to take and publicize a standardized test, among other uh, requirements. But I see Mara, so I think that means we're going to open it up to um, to other questions. Yeah, a big thank you to our panelists so that for this wonderful discussion so far. It's been so insightful, um, and we really deeply appreciate it. 
Uh, we're going to turn this over to some of the audience questions, and anybody can jump in on this panel or Jennifer to answer those. Uh, before we do that, really quick, ProPublica will share um, a link to our event survey in the chat box, uh, so your feedback on this event would be so helpful um, to us to inform us um, of content for future events. So would appreciate that if you have a moment. Um, again, if you'd like to ask a question, you can keep asking them in the by clicking that Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. We've had some great ones coming in. So without further ado, let me get to one that a lot of people are asking. And um, Amberly was sort of teeing us up for this, but anybody should jump in on it, which is, are segregation academies now being funded by taxpayers under universal voucher programs or even voucher-like programs? I know they exist across the South and beyond. Um, so anybody who wants to jump in and speak to that, do it. I, I can take a small stab and maybe Amberly has more, but the, I, I know that in North Carolina, uh, there, there certainly are uh, segregation academies receiving money through their voucher program. And uh, same thing with the state of Georgia. Those are just two states that I happen to have looked at. Uh, in Georgia, there are schools that are receiving money through, they have a voucher-like program. It's not a straight up vouchers um, there. So the answer to that would be yes. I would just I would just like to add that uh, with those programs, uh, one of my uh, questions would be, you know, I'm not so sure what statement is that, you know, I'm not so sure that the voucher programs is about so much about choice. Uh, is it about trying to maintain a drop, tremendously dropping enrollment at some of these segregation academies? I would just like to add that piece. And and I, I think that's worth noting, um, particularly in the Black Belt counties that we looked at. Um, many of the segregation academies were shrinking, partly because the population is shrinking. Uh, and so that was one of the questions that I ran into a fair amount was whether um, these academies would um, be willing to, for instance, in Alabama, uh, submit to a standardized test in order to receive the voucher funds. And um, I guess we'll see if that's the case. And can we pause really quick and just explain what the voucher system is, what that means, how it works real quick? Well, there, but there's different types in different states. There's um, vouchers, um, education savings accounts, tax credit scholarships. These are all variations of, of um, a somewhat similar system of basically taking public dollars and, and, and uh, using them to pay tuition and other education expenses at private schools. Amberly, did you want to jump in on any of that? Honestly, I can't really comment on the current voucher programs. I'm not very up to date on it. I'm I'm much more of the historical aspect. There is a question that uh, kind of segues into that in terms of um, like, was this kind of revenue shifting is the term that uh, asker of the question posed. Is this type of revenue shifting, was it happening back in the older uh, days of segregation academies? meaning state money, I think, going to those academies. So I'm not totally sure. Like I said, the earliest I found of this was about the Reagan era, Ronald Reagan. Um, but when I wrote my master's thesis, I basically had like a semester to write it. So I wasn't able to extend the timeline past around like 1972. So unfortunately, I don't have the answer for you. But um, when I start my dissertation research, I am going to try to extend that timeline to look into more of that. Great. Thank you. Um, I will. I wanted to uh, mention a question I think is quite interesting. Since Governor Kay Ivey is from Wilcox County, uh, was she interviewed about segregation academies and did she attend one? I, I can answer the um so Governor Ivey went to Wilcox County High School, the school um, that Cheryl desegregated, but she graduated before that. So she was there when the school was desegregated. So she was before uh, the segregation academy opened in Wilcox, right? Yes. Um, 
did Black students apply to these segregation academies? And if so, what happened when they did? What do we know about that? So as far as I'm aware, I think one of the first Black students in Wilcox Academy specifically was just a few years ago when I was there in 2019. Since then, they've had a handful of Black students come through and graduate, and I think there's one or two still there in the high school today. Um, but as far as other segregation academies, I know in neighboring counties, there are what they call entrance exams which allow them to pick and choose who is allowed into the schools. And they, like it's well known that they just don't allow African-American students to enroll in the schools. Jennifer, do you wanna to speak to any um, of the statistics on that? I know we have some insight into black population in segregation academies. Yes, hold on, I actually, a reader, um asked this question and I looked it up. So we found that about 90% of the segregation academies have at least some black students and the average that each admits of black students is about 7%. So uh, not a, a high number, um, but most have admitted uh, at least some. And we should note that many of these black belt counties um, in this part of Alabama and beyond in other parts of the South are majority black, um, sometimes as much as 70% black. So in places like that, 7% would be not a good representation of the community, I think is fair to say. Um, a reader asked, or a viewer I should say, asked where can we find a list of the 300 segregation academies that still exist? I may have missed this. How can I identify a segregation school? Well, there are other ways, um, for instance, there's um, Wikipedia has been uh, involved with this to some degree, but as far as our um, methodology, we are still working on a list that we are possibly going to make so it's searchable. Um, there's some details, for instance, when you look at religious schools, um, there's certain religious denominations that we have discussed and are talking with experts about whether to include. For instance, you generally wouldn't include Catholic schools. Um, those schools didn't appear to open primarily to avoid desegregation. Same thing with Jewish schools. But there are other denominations such as Baptists um, and some of the non-denominational Christian schools that seem more clearly uh, to have opened to avoid desegregation. Um, so we're moving through some of those details. Um, and there's just some very small categories uh, in some of the data sets that we're still um um, still debating um, with researchers whether they should be included. So stay tuned. And again, related to that, we were asked to what extent are religious communities contributing to the legacy of segregation academies and current voucher program policies? Kimberly, do you want to take that one or... Uh... Sure. Yeah. Um, so I know not to speak for Jennifer, but I know she said that a lot of people um, cite religion as a reason that they send their kids to these schools today. Um, it's really a way that they were able to kind of like use racial coding. They use those fundraisers. They use racial coding to say like, oh, this is a school. That's why we send our kids here. Um, from my experience working in the school, the only thing that makes it a religious school is that they have chapel once a week and they are allowed to actually have prayer in school. So they don't really have like Bible classes or anything like that. It's just kind of, which it, it might, that might be the defining factor for you if you're deciding where you want to send your children. I'm not saying that's not enough. I'm just saying it is definitely something that they like to highlight in like advocating for their school, but it's it's a very minimal part of their school environment. And, and Emily, it's, it's interesting that you say that because when I go back and reflect upon the school, Camden Academy, that Ms. Threadgill father was one of the leaders in years ago, uh, not only do they do all those things, but they also have a chapel on that campus that was a part of their everyday life. 
So that school was built out of the, uh, I think, out of the, the pre Presbyterian denomination. So that already existed. So it was solely because for religious reasons, uh, I don't think that we were necessary to be uh, be segregated. And 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 may I just, Maria Mara? Mara. May, may I please just add one other thing, please? Uh, Jennifer mentioned earlier about uh, the the uh, perception that the whites may have of the school or whatever, uh, uh, whether it's being inferior or whatever. But it's important for me that the students that we serve today, whoever we serve, understand the richness of the culture of those schools that their parents and grandparents are gone as well as they are today. So uh, it, it's almost just more important for me to understand, for them to be proud of what they, the, the academic program they're receiving, although it should be you know, integrated more, but not let someone outside of the building tell them that it's inferior when they don't have a clue what's inside of the other building that they never attended before. And I simply think they would be amazed. And while I have you, Dr. Salisbury, let me ask, do the school, do the public schools have the budget they need for books and e-resources? This is a, a, a viewer question. If not, can individuals give money to help them provide more? If so, so Yes. Well, we are all, we we are always open to additional resources that will uh, expose our students uh, to uh, a you know a global society. So we are always open as far as the technology and all of that. Uh, of course, you know we are in a technology age. You know some of our students don't always have access to being able to check out different computers and things like that. So we are open to those contributions, although we get we get some funding. One of our challenges, however, is that uh, where we are located, sometimes you have challenges with the web, with the internet in rural communities. Of course, our schools have it, but how can we get it into some households? Uh, how can we take a bus to a community? Uh, how can we ensure that children have a hot spot uh, that we may not necessarily be funded for, that we could probably send with them uh, an e-book that they could actually use at home. So yes, it's, we get state funding, but we are always open to different resources, not just for the school system, but also for our outskirts uh, tutorial programs, our after school programs in various communities, uh, contributions going towards those like Bama Kids or like Lily Baptist over in another community or like the community of Pineapple, uh, whereas we can't always put uh, resources there, but our students go to those after school programs. So, so yes, we have resources, but we are always open and we could always use the funding to expand that. And we will provide in a detail, in a detailed manner, what that funding is used for. There are so many good questions coming in in about seven minutes left. So I'm gonna to try to get to as many as I can. Um, does segregation have to always mean or imply lesser accomplishment? There were and are plenty of solid academic black colleges and schools across the country. And we know this is worrying about segregation, something whose time has come and gone. Should we perhaps be more focused on predominantly black, how, on how, predominantly black schools can be made better if they need to be? It's a long question, I, but it's a good one. I think that is that is so very interesting. Um, yes, we continue to concentrate on how those institutions are made better, I agree. But outside of those institutions, when you go into the workplace, I think when you have cultures together, when you have black and whites working together from time to time, I think it can make things so much easier and we can be so much more successful along the way. So yes, uh, yeah, continue to make the black institution better. I, I agree with that. But let's not forget about once you walk out of the door of those institutions, once you walk out the door and then you have to go into the corporate world or go and go and participate in other type of things, you shouldn't have to try to learn your way because you have not been around a certain group of people. I think that stifles growth. Just my thought. 
Yes. There's a question somewhat on the flip side of that, which is do segregation academies teach African-American history studies? Do we know? Amberly says no. Um, I mean, I can't speak for all segregation academies. The one I taught at, no. Um, this is a variation on something we talked about before, but I like the sort of more the direct way this is worded, which is there is some case law that says that some private institutions like hotels and restaurants are not allowed to discriminate. Why are private schools given permission to do so? I know that's a somewhat legal question, but as a historian and Jennifer, as somebody who's looked at this, do you guys have thoughts on that? Go ahead. I'll take one bite of that is that, um, if they want to remain tax exempt entities, they have to publish a non discrimination um, policy. Now, that doesn't mean that they're admitting, you know, a representative group of students, but they do have to have a policy like that. And some and these schools did run into this problem for some time uh, in, in in the seventies, as I recall. Um, so they're they're not legally supposed to. But uh, Amberly was making the point earlier. You know, there are other ways that you can admit and not admit the students that you want, such as performance tests or whatever kind of of, of test you you come up with. There's one last question, and I would love to hear from everybody on this because, um, as you'll see, it's a it's a question of hope. Uh, what or oh, sorry, uh, somebody on the call was saying, beginning to really wonder what the hope for change is. Any words of encouragement? I, I mentioned earlier that, that there are some opportunities for mixing of the races. And I think we need to encourage both the races to take advantage of the, the opportunities. A lot of that is around the arts. Black Belt Treasures has art camps for children. We went last week and um, that is a perfect opportunity, I think, for children to get to know each other. And we have to encourage that. Or start from the community up. Things that we do have control of. And, and I just add on that note that, you know, within the public school uh, system, uh, I believe that although things may uh, be like they are at this time, uh, I am hopeful when I see so many teachers in the public school systems writing grants where they are providing so many enrichment activities outside of Wilcox County that allow, in addition to the activities Ms. Threadgear mentioned, that allow our students to be exposed to the off-Broadway plays in, in Atlanta and all those things where they're around other students participate in different camps in Columbiana, uh, to go to different type of uh diff different type of uh competitions at Auburn University, University of Alabama, University of South Alabama, Alabama State University, where they are around other students. So while I may not necessarily be able to impact students coming, uh, 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 the immigration here necessarily, that that uh, I, I just feel so great when they get the Alabama Power Grants and other grants that take them out and expose them and let them be around other students, uh, other white students that, and then they later become and be a lifelong friendships. And they later meet up with them when they go to school at Auburn or UA, uh, USA, uh, ASU. So uh, I'm hopeful that, well, I'm, I'm kind of proud of the fact that, you know, we are able to do those things. And I believe that it will get them, the students in the public school, steps closer to understanding and being open to one another in the workplace or uh, in the real world, so to speak. Versus just sitting here saying, this is the standard. This is what it is. And I are Ms. Sure, Ms. Threadgill not trying to impact that otherwise. Yeah, I was just gonna add, I mean, I went to a rural public school. I was among many different races of people. I had a great time. I had a great education given to me. Um, and so I think that 
Wilcox County being almost completely segregated in education isn't necessarily a wide lens of rural Alabama. There is a lot of integration within rural Alabama. And so maybe it can also, you know, trickle down a little bit more to these counties that do have more segregation within them. So maybe that can help integrate rural communities. We won't have time to delve into it, but um, I should note that Jennifer wrote a story about a community, the next county over the, where the schools are integrated and it's worth um, our viewers time. If you have a moment for that, uh, I just wanted to say thank you deeply to all of you who gave us your time today, both our panelists and uh, the many viewers who uh, asked questions, have read and engaged with these stories, um, and I know who will go out and maybe report back to us on the progress in their communities. Uh, again, this event has been recorded. Uh, you'll receive an email with the full video of today's event, uh, and a link to our event survey uh, is going up in the chat box now. If you're so kind as to give us some feedback, we'd really appreciate it. Um, from all of us at ProPublica, thank you for joining us. Have a great evening, and we hope to see you here next time.